Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1157 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The 2022 World Radio Sport Team Championship has been postponed until 2023 due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. An Arizona legislator introduces a bill in Congress to designate April 18th, 2022 as National Amateur Radio Operators Day. The FCC auto registration feature for exam applicants will be discontinued shortly. In-person amateur radio exams resume in Norway. The ARRL Executive Committee nominates Joel Harrison, W5ZN, to be the next International Amateur Radio Union Secretary. The league extends the 2020 Field Day rule waivers for Field Day 2021 and adds Class D and Class E power limits. We'll have all the details. The FCC updated radio frequency exposure rules become effective this week, Monday, May 3rd. We'll have the details on that for you. Four amateur radio operators aboard the International Space Station are on their way home this weekend. And a San Francisco sound engineer was accidentally dosed with LSD while restoring a vintage 1960s synthesizer found in a college closet. Be careful when dusting out that vintage gear. We'll have the story for you in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, asks the question, are you afraid of technology? And he will discuss an older technology, the FCC cable card. Australia's own Anno Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, exactly how much bandwidth is there? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill discusses amateur radio during the early days of World War II and something called the War Emergency Service. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will have more to tell you about tower climbing safety. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in cold, chilly, rainy, windy, snowy Albany, New York, winter just won't give up here, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, I'm Rich Lawrence. KB2MOB. And reporting from along the southern edge of Lake Ontario in snowy and cold Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it still hasn't decided to be spring or summer yet, and in fact it's snowing as we speak, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where spring seems to be back on track, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where summer is now upon us, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where summer is starting to peek around the corner, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now, with our lead story, here is Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Leading off the news this week is word that World Radio Sport Team Championship 2022 has been postponed for one year. At WRTC 2022 Association Assembly on April 23rd, the event's organizing committee decided to put off WRTC 2022 until 2023 after consulting with the World Radio Sport Team Championship Sanctioning Committee. The WRTC, which was to have been held in July 2022 in Bologna, Italy, has been postponed until 2023. In making the announcement, Carlo, IK1, HJS, Organizing Committee President, said the difficult decision was made after considering various nations' responses to the public health challenges brought by the pandemic. Carlo said, 
recent communications from competitors have highlighted various challenges being faced in other nations. There have been no changes in the qualification process or to the overall structure of the event and its sponsoring committee. Although more details will be released later by the committee, Carlo underscored that the postponement will ensure a fair qualification process for all the event's international competitors while retaining the same overall structure. The last WRTC competition was held in Wittenberg, Germany in 2018, where Ed Durant, DD5LP, was a proud member of the publicity team. We wish the WRTC 2023 Organizing Committee all the best for the next Olympics of Amateur Radio. Further announcements will be forthcoming as new arrangements for the event have been made. Arizona Congresswoman Debbie Lesko has reintroduced a resolution with bipartisan support to designate April 18, 2022 as National Amateur Radio Operators Day. Introduced on April 19, the measure recognizes the important contributions amateur radio operators have made. She introduced a similar bill in the last Congress. Throughout history, amateur radio operators have provided invaluable services to our communities, Lesko said in a news release. I am proud to reintroduce this resolution to honor the important contributions amateur radio operators have made in Arizona and across our nation. Amateur radio has brought people together and has provided critical emergency communications during natural disasters. Amateur radio is a vital part of our nation's communications infrastructure. Lesko said she was initially approached to introduce the resolution during the last Congress by then 12-year-old Raymond Anderson, N7KCB, of Peoria, Arizona. As Lesko's resolution notes, the International Amateur Radio Union designates each April 18th as World Amateur Radio Day to recognize the founding of the IARU in 1925. She said her resolution would recognize the amateur radio community with a national day in the U.S. The resolution cites the Amateur Radio Emergency Service for providing invaluable emergency communication services following recent natural disasters, including but not limited to helping coordinate disaster relief efforts following Hurricanes Katrina, Wilma and Maria, and other extreme weather disasters. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, praised the initiative. The voluntary contributions of America's approximately 774,000 amateur radio operators in support of the critical communications infrastructure of the United States are rarely recognized, Roderick said. Congresswoman Lesko's resolution is an important first step in correcting that oversight. On behalf of ARRL's members and all amateur radio operators, I commend Congresswoman Lesko for her support of amateur radio and her leadership in bringing deserved recognition of the 106 plus years of amateur radio's substantial influence on the development of modern communications. Lesko was joined by members of both parties as original co-sponsors of the resolution. The list includes Representatives Robert Adderholt of Alabama, Julia Brownlee of California, Kat Kamak of Florida, Paul Gosar of Arizona, Glenn Grothman of Wisconsin, Vicki Hartzler of Missouri, Ashley Hinson of Iowa, Chris Jacobs of New York, Kaiali Kahele of Hawaii, Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania, Doug LaMalfa of California, and Daniel Webster of Florida. Auto registration in the FCC Commission Registration System Amateur Radio Exam for candidates using a Social Security number will be discontinued on May 20th of 2021. Applicants must use an FCC registration number for all licensed seat transactions with the FCC. Examiners must register in CORES, C-O-R-E-S, and receive an FRN before exam day. Starting on May 20th, electronic batch file applications that do not include a candidate's FRN will be rejected. The Social Security Licensee ID field will be disabled. An instructional video provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to establish a CORS account, which is necessary for licensees. After June 29th, all filers must provide an email address on all applications. When an email is provided, applicants will receive an official electronic copy of their license once granted, allowing incoming mail from authorizations at FCC.gov. 
If no email is provided when filing on or after June 29, the applications will be rejected. ARRLVEC suggests that those without access to mail use the email address of a family member or a friend. Licensees need to log into the Universal Licensing System to download their authorizations. The FCC no longer issues paper copies. There are some new licensed amateurs in Norway now that it has resumed its in-person license exams. Six of Norway's newest amateur radio operators celebrated their shared accomplishment which was long awaited due to months of no license exams being possible because of the pandemic. Where many countries have been administering the tests virtually since last year, Norway has no such system. Ten candidates showed up for testing on the 20th of April at the ARK Student Amateur Radio Club in Trondheim, Norway. Six of them passed the multiple choice test, which has 40 questions. There is only one class of amateur radio license in Norway which permits the use of one kilowatt of power. There's a new young ham in Pennsylvania who has bragging rights to setting a record in Montour County. Vincent Kaler, KC3RXV, a Pennsylvania third grader, is still very good friends with Abby Smith, KC3OTG, even though he has claimed an honor that Abby proudly won last year. At the age of eight, Vincent has become the youngest licensed amateur radio operator in Pennsylvania's Montour County. That was Abby's claim to fame last year after getting her license when she was 11. The two became friends through scouting and Abby's father. Thomas Smith, KC3OLH, coached Vincent and his studies for his FCC exam. Now Vincent can join his father, Lee Kaler, KC3RXX, and mother Cynthia Kaler, KC3RXW, on the air. But this youngster already has an ambitious agenda beyond that. Inspired by Abby's own involvement in emergency response work, Vincent has become Skywarn certified and plans to join the Amateur Radio Emergency Services and the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. He's also a member of the Young Amateur Communications HAM Team, a club for young radio operators. Meanwhile, he's collecting more than just congratulations. Vincent has already started receiving some of his first QSL cards. A backcountry hiker was rescued from Great Smoky Mountains National Park with assistance from Amateur Radio after she became exhausted on the trail and possibly dehydrated. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reports from League Headquarters. A member of the hiking group, Tim Luttrell, KA9EBJ, put out a call via the W4KEV linked VHF repeater in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, requesting assistance in extricating the injured member. No cell phone service was available at the location. This is uh, KA9EBJ. We are on the Little River Trail in the Smoky Mountains, about three quarters of a mile from the back country campsite number 30. We need some assistance in getting a hiker out of the area. Responding was David Manuel, W5DJR, who obtained more information and called 911, which routed the call to Great Smoky Mountains National Park Emergency Medical Service. The National Park EMS relayed a request for the group to continue down the trail as far as possible to shorten the rescue time. A medic with the Park Service search and rescue team subsequently reached Manuel by telephone and he served to relay questions to Luttrell. Manuel got a call from Luttrell later indicating all clear shortly after 2 a.m. The injured hiker had to be hospitalized. ARRL Tennessee Section Manager Dave Thomas, KM4NYI, told ARRL that he'd learned another hiker in the same group was close to hypothermia by the time of the rescue. Thomas will recognize each of the radio amateurs involved in the rescue with a certificate of merit during the ARRL Tennessee State Convention in Knoxville on June 19th. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Manuel contacted members of the hiker's family after Luttrell provided contact numbers. Manuel was asked to relay information for the family to arrange to meet in Cherokee, North Carolina, and be prepared to transport the distressed hiker's vehicle to her home. By this time, a couple of hours had passed. Manuel maintained occasional contact with Luttrell, who indicated that all was well, but his battery was low and that he would power down the radio in between contact attempts to conserve power. Manuel later received a text indicating that the family members had connected with the distressed hiker and extended their thanks to all who had helped out. Luttrell said afterward that Manuel was calm, professional, and persistent, but 
patient in obtaining information he needed through the challenges I was having with my radio. He allowed that without his spare battery pack and high-gain antenna, the incident may not have gone so well. A newer radio had been damaged in an earlier rescue effort, he told ARRL Tennessee Section Manager Dave Thomas, KM4NYI. The injured hiker was hospitalized and required surgery and rehabilitation. Ham Radio Prep, the nation's fastest growing amateur radio education program, has submitted 25 suggested questions to the National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators for use on the upcoming revision of the Amateur Radio Technician Class Examination Pool set to go into effect next year. The NCVEC revises question pools used in the examinations for the three amateur radio license classes every four years, and the new question and answer pool for the technician license is scheduled to take effect on July 1, 2022. NCVEC issued a call for suggested questions for the question pool with a submission deadline of June 30, 2021. Ham Radio Prep has tens of thousands of students who have used its courses for the technician, general, and amateur extra classes of licenses. Because of that, the organization feels uniquely qualified to offer insight and input on the new question pool for the technician exam. The new questions were generated in a variety of ways, according to Chuck Giese, general manager of Ham Radio Prep. In submitting these questions, Ham Radio Prep drew upon the expertise of its own staff as well as its many students to draw together questions we feel are important to be included on the next round of technician class exams, Giese said. Our students often have comments about the questions they encounter on their exams, and we have used that input in an effort to bring their experience to the NCVEC question pool committee. Questions submitted to the NCVEC included correct answers and distractors on a variety of subjects ranging from amateur radio operations, technology, emissions, Federal Communications Commission rules and regulations, frequency use, and more. There are more than 750,000 licensed amateur radio operators in the United States and its territories. Ham Radio Prep offers courses designed to teach people online the information they need to take exams that grant them Federal Communications Commission licenses for amateur radio. The courses also teach students how to be legal and safe on the airwaves in accordance with FCC rules and regulations. Ham Radio Prep was established in 2017 to assist people interested in obtaining an FCC-issued amateur radio license by offering courses for the FCC technician, general, and extra class licenses. ARRL has awarded a Colvin grant of $5,000 to the Intrepid DX Group to help in funding its 3YOJ de-expedition to Bouvet Island, scheduled for January to February of 2023. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more on the grant in this report from League Headquarters. ARRL Life member Paul Ewing, N6PSE, and ARRL member Ken Opscar, LA7GIA, will share leadership for the now 15-person multinational team. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic. It is the second most wanted DXCC entity behind North Korea. The last Bouvet activation was 3Y0E in 2007-2008. Ewing has said the team began planning for the Bouvet de-expedition on the heels of its successful 2016 VP8STI and VP8SGI efforts. The announced budget for the 2023 de-expedition is $764,000. The Northern California DX Foundation and the International DX Association are major sponsors. The Colvin Award is funded by an endowment established by the legendary DX couple Lloyd Colvin, W6KG, and Iris Colvin, W6QL, both now deceased. The Colvin Award is intended to support amateur radio projects that promote international goodwill in the field of DX. The plan calls for spending 20 days on Bouvet with 14 to 16 days of radio activity. Ewing has called on the DX community for support in achieving its mission of 100,000 or more contacts from Bouvet Island. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. 
Grantees must be groups with a favorable DX track record and with experience directly related to the proposed enterprise. The proposed project must have as a goal a significant achievement in the field of DX. Preference is given to multinational groups, all of whom are members of their own National International Amateur Radio Union Members Societies. Ewing said in a recent interview that the 2016 VP-8 STI and the VP-8 SGI de-expeditions provided perfect preparation for the Bouvet de-expedition. A 2018 de-expedition to Bouvet by another team had to be scuttled, along with Bouvet Island being already in view after encountering severe weather and an engine problem. The team will make the best use of propagation and modes on 10 through 160 meters with operations on single sideband, CW, and digital modes. Follow the Intrepid DX Group's 3YOJ plans via Facebook. Visit the 3YOG website for more information and to make a donation. To encourage young radio sport participants, National Contest Journal will recognize their entries in the North American CUSO Party starting with the August 2021 NAQP, CW, and NAQP SSB events. Following the lead of Youth on the Air and International Amateur Radio Union Region 1, operators 25 years old and younger will be highlighted in the results. The NAQP log upload app and 3830scores.com will include a Youth 25 and Under checkbox. Initially, the young operator designation will apply only to single operator entries. This is not a separate category. Participants of any age will compete for awards in the regular single operator category. 3830 scores will display the young operator scores as an overlay to the single operator group. NAQP line scores will note the young operator scores and a separate table of these scores will be included in the results and referenced in the NCJ Next Gen Contesters column by Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. The U.S. Department of Defense will host this year's Armed Forces Day crossband test Friday and Saturday, May 7th and 8th, in recognition of Armed Forces Day on May 15th. The event is open to all radio amateurs. For more than 50 years, military and amateur stations have taken part in this exercise designed to include amateur radio and government radio operators alike. The Armed Forces Day crossband test is a unique opportunity to test two-way communications between military and amateur radio stations as authorized under FCC Part 97 rules. These tests provide opportunities and challenges for radio operators to demonstrate individual technical skills in a tightly controlled exercise in which military stations will transmit on selected military frequencies and will announce the specific amateur radio frequencies being monitored. The schedule of military government stations taking part in the Armed Forces Day crossband test and information on the Armed Forces Day message is available on the MARS website. Complete the request form to obtain a QSL card. The pandemic modified AWRL field day rules for 2020 will continue this June with the addition of a power limit imposed on Class D home stations and Class E home stations running emergency power. With more details to refresh your memory of the pandemic modified field day rules for 2021, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The news from the ARRL Board's Programs and Services Committee comes as many clubs and groups are starting preparations for Field Day in earnest. Field Day 2021 will take place June 26 and 27. For Field Day 2021, Class D stations may work all other Field Day stations, including other Class D stations, for points. This year, however, Class D and Class E stations will be limited to 150 watts PEP output. For Field Day 2021, an aggregate club score will be published just as it was done last year. The aggregate score will be a sum of all individual entries that attributed their scores to that of a specific club. ARRL Field Day is one of the biggest events on the amateur radio calendar. Last summer, a record 10,213 entries were received. The ARRL Field Day webpage, www.arrl.org forward slash field hyphen day, contains complete rules and entry forms as well as any updated information as it becomes available. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME.
This early decision should alleviate any hesitancy that radio clubs and individual field day participants may have with their planning for the event, said ARRL contest program manager Paul Baroque, N1SFE. With the greater flexibility afforded by the rules waivers, individuals and groups will still be able to participate in field day while still staying within any public health recommendations and or requirements, Baroque said. The preferred method of submitting entries after field day is via the web applet. The ARRL field day rules include instructions on how to submit entries, which must be submitted or postmarked by Tuesday, July 27, 2021. Once again, ARRL field day webpage contains complete rules and entry forms, as well as any updated information as it becomes available. You can join the ARRL field day Facebook page also for more information. The chair of the IARU Region 1 Spectrum Affairs, Barry Lewis, Golf 4 Sierra Juliet Hotel, has reported on the work being done in defending the interests of the amateur services in the 23 centimetre band, that's 1240 to 1300 megahertz. Barry said that the International Amateur Radio Union is continuing to represent the amateur service's interests in the 23 centimetre band in coexistence discussions with the Galileo GLONASS Radio Navigation Satellite Service. The most recent project team meeting of the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications, better known as CEPT, was held from the 24th to the 26th of March 2021. At that meeting, the first coexistence calculations were introduced, based on some initial assumptions about the amateur service operation. The IARU is continuing to work with the regulators to refine the details of these assumptions and make the calculations more representative of typical amateur station characteristics and band usage. So, these first calculations are considered only as a starting point, and the meeting agreed that further work is needed to develop the calculations into a more comprehensive study. Measurement campaigns have shown that the potential for coexistence depends very much on the frequency of the amateur service transmissions in the 23 centimetre band with respect to the radio navigation satellite services receiver bandwidth. This aspect needs to be considered more carefully once the initial scenarios and calculations are agreed. In addition, the IARU continues to have questions about the protection criteria required by the navigation system receivers, and in particular how they relate to that service's operational and service provision behaviour. The IARU has ensured alignment of the amateur service information being used in these CEPT discussions, with that being used in parallel work currently occurring in the ITU in the lead-up to World Radio Conference 2023. You can download the CEPT meeting input paper titled Amateur vs. Radio Navigation Satellite Services Interference Areas, which was submitted by France from CEPT.org. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. Is technology scary? Been one, I've been wondering this. We have a lot of movies about technology gone wild, you know, Terminator. There's a lot of movies about computers, you know, war games and computers just kind of, you know, gaining. <laughs> I think the thing that scares us most is that like they'll they'll gain sentience. They'll be they'll be like aware. That's that's scary, I guess. HAL 9000 seemed nice at the time. Seemed like a nice computer at the time. Didn't seem like a bad guy. Kind of helpful. Could play a really good game of chess. And then it locked Dave out of the pod bay door, man. That's not cool, man. Not okay. Technology, I think, is neutral. I don't know. Is it? What do you think? I think it's neutral. I think it's, um, I think some people would argue, oh, no, technology is always good. And yeah, when it comes to things like, uh, I don't know, zippers, those are good. Light bulbs, those are good. Although, I guess, you know, you can always, there's always the counter argument. There's a counter argument on zippers I won't go into, but there are some gentlemen who prefer not to wear zippers. There's also the issue of light. You know, we're not, our, our biology is not used to light between sundown and sunrise. And so, you know, all this, all this light, especially the blue kind, blue light, really bad. I mean, there's, so there's that. You could argue that there's some technology that seems pretty bad on the face of it, maybe the atom bomb, but there's still an argument there. I think it's basically neutral. It's what we do with it, right? 
and I was thinking about this this morning, in the shower, which is my favorite technology. Thank you, Archimedes or whoever, <laughs> for figuring that one out. Nice job. We needed that. That was a that was a good uh, a good good catch. Good find. Shower bath. Actually, I've been reading a great book called Clean about the history of bathing. <laughs> he talks about the Middle Ages. He said some historians call it a thousand years without a bath. <laughs> It's a fascinating book. You know, our our, uh, our attitude toward cleanliness has shifted back and forth. Now, right now, we're all about being clean. Wash your hands, 20 seconds, right? We're all, isn't that weird? We're learning how to wash our hands like we didn't know. Like you have to have videos and new Apple Watch coming out sometime any minute now. Maybe even this week. It's got a little hand washing routine in it. Ah, I see you're washing your hands. Would you like some help? If you ask your Amazon Echo to play the hand-washing song, it'll sing a song for 20 seconds. A really terrible song. Makes you want to wash your hands faster. So the, I think medical technology, that's probably good, right? Well, yeah. I think it's what we do with it. And that's one of the things that has made my uh, career, really. It's, it's always been the principle behind what I do. And I've been doing this now since the 70s. Wow. Long time. Uh, which is, I like technology. I love technology. I like to play with it, right? But I also think it's important to understand it and to use it uh, intelligently, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't think if you, if I don't, I think if you don't understand it, then it, there's a tendency to say, oh, it's magic. That's probably not a good approach. It isn't magic, it's science. Technology, if you really think about it, is scientific theory made whole, made real, which is really cool. I'll give you a good example, the theory of relativity. Now you would think, well, that's blue sky. There's nothing that can do with that, right? We wouldn't have GPS if it weren't for the theory of relativity. GPS satellites have to account for the fact that they're moving and that they, uh, they have to adjust for the fact that they're at a different gravitational plane so all sorts of interesting things that we wouldn't be able to do without even stuff that seems so blue sky. So technology it wouldn't exist without deep scientific understanding. And that's the thing. If you don't, if you're scared of technology, well, <sighs> I understand. I don't, I don't blame you, I guess, but uh, surely we can, uh, we can figure it out together. So I guess that's kind of my job is that is so to help you understand it, help you use it most importantly, because you know what? There people are going to use it against us if we don't we don't learn how to use it ourselves. So it's good to understand it. It is being used by governments and marketers and all sorts of ways that we may not approve of. So it's important to understand that. That's what we talk about. This is probably pretty inside baseball, but I know some of you like me. Uh, use a cable card. You know what that is? Cable card? This is the thing the FCC used to, used to require. Uh, the cable companies offer you so you could use your own gear instead of having to use the cable company's box or DVR. The cable card was a really kind of neat idea. It was a credit card device for people, old timers, internet technology people going back a ways. You would recognize it as what we used to call a PCMCIA card pcmcia yeah that that card it was like a credit card but it had electronics in it and the idea was it was like kind of like nowadays you could do it with a sim card truthfully but this was this is an old technology been around a long time nowadays you could do it with a sim card but uh in the old days and the cable company still seems to be living in the old days they would make this pcmcia card that you could i left out an m didn't i pcmcia it's a lot of letters, card, that you would put in a device like a TiVo, for instance, and it would make it the cable box. So you didn't have to use the junky cable box the cable company provided. And you'd rent it from them. They're making a little money on it, a couple bucks, five bucks, something like that. FCC has just ruled, put out a little ruling, didn't, didn't really pay any, you know, didn't make a big deal about it. It didn't, it didn't get a lot of attention because I think it's a, it's a small market. But thank goodness for David Zatz of ZatzNotFunny.com. Because if it weren't for him, I might not even be uh, be aware of this. But I use, I have three cable cards in my house, three TiVos, three cable cards. The FCC has in effect said, we are eliminating a proceeding 
in which we saw a comment on the adoption of new regulations for navigation devices. That's what the FCC calls them. Devices consumers use to access video programming and other services offered over multi-channel video programming networks, cable networks. And here's the important part. Eliminate outdated cable card support and reporting requirements. FCC said, don't worry, the market will keep the cable card alive. I don't know. According to the FCC, there are half a million cable cards in circulation, and they drop every year about 10%. People aren't using them anymore. You know why? <laughs> Not because everybody's saying, oh, I got to use that Comcast box or that Cox box or the Spectrum box. No, because people are saying, I just need internet. Just give me internet. I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you think. Yesterday, Dick D. Bartol and I were talking about predictions. We had we <laughs> read back my predictions from 2009, which were wildly inaccurate. But I'm going to make another, <laughs> another prediction. Maybe possibly wildly inaccurate. I don't even think it's going to take 10 years. Maybe it'll take uh, five. But more and more of us are going to start getting our, our content over the top, you know, through the Internet, not through the cable company. And that really, in the long run, it might make more sense for eliminating cable cards. Just eliminate cable. See, that's not what the cable company wants, but I think that may be the unintended consequence of this. Just eliminate the cable. Uh, and go over the internet. And of course, I think most cable companies realize that's the future and are starting to offer more and more on-demand stuff over the internet. And of course, certainly the content companies know that's the future. That's why all of a sudden there's HBO Max and Peacock and uh, Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus. These are all over-the-top streaming networks where you, you pay a fee, a monthly fee, ranging from 5 to $15 a month. Hulu is another one. And you get your uh, TV from the internet. Will it be cheaper? No, no, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. There are right now freeways. There's a uh, an app, maybe you've seen it called Lowcast, L-O-C-A-S-T, that lets you watch TV, your local channels free. I don't know how they're getting away with this, but somehow they are. So there, are, and there's people talk, tell, always write into me, say, you can, it's cheaper, you can get Pluto or other inexpensive solutions, ad supported solutions. And that that's probably the case. That'll probably live live on. Then you have to add the internet. And of course, the cable companies aren't dumb. The price of internet access is slowly going up, right? I called, Com I called Comcast to get a, a faster service and, and no bandwidth caps because they, they, they cap you out at a terabyte, which I run through pretty quickly. And then it's, what I don't know, $50 per 10 gigabytes or something. It's expensive. So I said, can, is there anything, no bandwidth? They said, oh, yes, we can do that for you. And I said, can, and how fast can I go? Oh, you can go to gigabit. I said, you're kidding. I had no idea you offered that. Yeah. And you know what? It's going to cost you less than you're paying right now. I said, how is that? He said, our special one-year offer. And now I remember. I did this a couple of years ago. Our special offer, it's only 99 bucks. But you forget that it's only for a year or two after the term runs out. Whoosh, it gets really expensive. Whoosh. And they figure you, by this time, you're, you're, you know, you're captive. You're not, either not going to notice so I got more service, better service for less money. I'm even paying for phone service from uh, Xfinity that I don't use. I don't want an Xfinity phone. I don't want a phone at all. Who has landlines anymore? I got a cell phone. What do I need a phone for? But it's cheaper if I get the service. Figure that out. Triple play is cheaper than the double play. Oh, yeah, because in a year, whoop, goes... <laughs> So I put a little note to myself in my calendar, my future self. I should send an email to my future self. Future self, don't forget, talk to Comcast and get them, get at the new package deal because the price is about to go way up. This is the world we live in now. This really is it. Everything is, uh, is, is changing from our content. In fact, you know, I talked to somebody yesterday, a couple of the watches uh, YouTube. In fact... Turns out the Trump campaign, the presidential campaign, as you know, an election a couple of months off, the uh, presidential campaign, the Trump campaign stopped TV advertising. Yeah, they were. You may remember uh, really big on YouTube last time. The stop, uh, not YouTube, Facebook last time. They kind of slowed that down. It's all about the YouTube now. What? Yeah, they're buying tons of YouTube ads. YouTube doesn't say how much they're spending, but it looks like they've they've moved most of the budget off of television off of even Facebook, which they were masters of four years ago. And it's now now all about YouTube. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip? 
into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Less than 24 hours later, the United States was officially at war, and the FCC had issued Order Number 87, which suspended all amateur radio operations in the U.S. and withdrew our frequencies from the amateur service. However, the FCC did recognize that limited amateur operation would be required in connection with domestic civil defense work. Thus, in June 1942, the FCC issued regulations which created the War Emergency Radio Service, or WERS for short. This was not an amateur operation, even though the frequencies used were our former bands at 112 through 116, 224 through 230, and 400 through 401 megacycles. Notice that the 5 meter band, 56 to 60 megacycles, was not included. The FCC apparently sought to limit operations to the UHF frequencies where long distance skip was impossible. A WERS license was not given to an individual, but rather to a municipality or other local government entity to cover the operation of all such stations engaged in emergency civilian defense communications. Operations could only be conducted upon authorization of the local civil defense corps. Operators in WERS had to be loyal U.S. citizens with the fingerprints and proof of U.S. citizenship on file with the FCC. They also needed to have an FCC commercial or amateur license or an FCC third-class operating certificate. Thus, although most operators were hams, many non-amateurs were active in this service also. Authorized operations in the War Emergency Radio Service were limited to emergencies relating to enemy activity. There was no provision for operations in natural disasters. Practice and training sessions were allowed, and local governments may have used these practice activities to provide needed communications during natural disasters. Technical standards were strict for 1942. The carrier frequency could not deviate more than one-tenth of one percent in the lower half of each band and three-tenths of one percent in the upper half. In the two-and-a-half meter band, this meant that the signal could not vary more than 112 kilocycles at the lower end and 340 kilocycles at the upper end. While this sounds incredibly wide today, remember that in the 1930s and 1940s, almost all UHF transmitters used the modulated oscillator, cheap to build, but not very stable. The only receiver useful with this type of signal was the super regenerative. Power was limited to 25 watts input, which meant about 10 to 15 watts output. By default, 2.5 meters became the band of choice for WERS operations. In fact, it came to be known as the Civil Defense Band. The most popular radio in WERS operation was the TR-4 by Abbott Instruments of New York City. The unit measured only 9 inches by 8 inches by 4.5 inches, ran on 6 volts DC or 110 volts AC, had a range up to 75 miles and cost less than $40. Although WERS served a valuable purpose, it did not satisfy the needs of an active amateur suffering under the wartime radio silence. Fortunately, the World War II amateur had it far better than his World War I predecessor. For one thing, amateurs did not have to disassemble their stations and take down their antennas. Contrary to popular belief, the FCC did not ban shortwave listening. AM broadcasting was still allowed. W1AW was authorized to remain on the air. QST was still published. But even with all of this, the restless amateur wanted more. And believe it or not, some hams legally got on the air and had QSOs. How? Wired Wireless. Have you ever heard of it? In summary, Wired Wireless was a carrier current type of operation. A transmitter, usually running 10 to 25 watts output, was inductively coupled to the AC power line. The signal will follow the power lines throughout the city up to a maximum of about five miles. Anyone within 300 feet or so of the AC power line would be able to copy the signal. 
even though the range was a five mile radius from the transmitter, the actual radiation distance was only 300 feet from the wires. Thus, it was legal. Amateurs found that carrier current operations work best in the long wave spectrum and set up hundreds of stations in the 160 to 200 kilocycle range. Ironically, the 160 to 190 kilocycle segment survives to this day as a legal unlicensed low power band with one watt and 50 foot antennas permitted. Some amateurs experimented with audio frequency induction field communications. This involved no RF. An audio oscillator was coupled to a large inductor. At distances of 2,000 to 3,000 feet away, an audio amp coupled to a similar inductor received the signal. QST was active during the war years, running articles on secret communications and ciphers, the latest 112 megacycle WERS equipment, visual signaling including the semaphore alphabet, a course in radio fundamentals, a multi-part series in cryptanalysis, and the Japanese Morris Telegraph Code with notes on the Japanese language. Towards the end of the war, QST ran several articles on post-war amateur allocations. Two columns focused on amateurs serving in the armed forces, in the service, and hams in combat. And, as a grim reminder of the horrors of war, the column Gold Stars listed those amateurs who made the ultimate sacrifice. In our next installment, we will look at amateur life in the post-war world. As a postscript, the ARRL has asked that the 160 through 190 kilohertz band be reallocated to amateur use. Will the ghosts of the World War II operators be listening as we once again activate that band with CQs? You decide. As part of the RSGB AGM held on April the 24th, John Rogers, Mike Zero, Juliet Alpha Victor provided an update on the new Ofcom EMF license regulations in the UK. His presentation, which is followed by a question and answer session, starts at 2 hours, 14 minutes and 25 seconds into the AGM video, which can be watched on the RSGB YouTube channel. Once you're on the channel, just search for 2021 AGM. And you can download the latest version of the RSGB Ofcom EMF calculator from the RSGB EMF page at rsgb.org forward slash EMF. And the RSGB has released the first in a series of pre-assessed configurations for typical amateur radio installations, which amateurs may choose to use to assist with the new EMF regulation. The first of these PACs covers half-wave dipoles on the bands from 1.8 to 7 MHz. It should be noted that the document presents work in progress on a complex subject that is still under development. Details are subject to change and the pre-assessed configurations and referenced material may be updated or replaced. Draft versions of the pre-assessed configurations will be posted on the RSGB EMF page as they're prepared. So keep going back and check rsgb.org forward slash EMF. Also at the RSGB AGM held on April the 24th, the Society awarded the Louis Varney Cup for advances in space communications to Dave Crump, Golf 8 Golf, Kilo, Quebec. Dave accepts this award as chair of the British Amateur Television Club. His leadership of the BATC community, both in the UK and overseas, has been instrumental in enabling the QO100 satellite wideband transponder to be fully utilised, with many new digital amateur television systems being developed since the launch of the spacecraft. This award acknowledges the exciting and significant contributions made by many members of the BATC, both in terms of software and hardware. The RSGB 2021 Awards and Trophies can be viewed on the RSGB website at rsgb.org and information on the QO100 geostationary satellite transponders can be found at amsat-uk.org. Foundations of Amateur Radio Have you ever taken a moment to consider the available bandwidth on the various amateur bands? As an entrant into Amateur Radio in Australia, as a Foundation license holder, you have access to six different amateur bands. The 80 meter band, 40 meters, 15 meters, 10 meters, 2 meters and 70 centimeters. If you add the bandwidth from each of those bands together, you end up with 26.65 megahertz worth of bandwidth to play with in Australia. I can tell you that's a big chunk of bandwidth, but until I give you some context, 26.65 MHz isn't likely something that you can picture. You might think of things as being pretty crowded. For example, 
On the 40 meter band during a contest, it's common to hear wall to wall signals. There's barely enough room to call CQ and not interfere with anyone else. But how crowded is it really? Let's start with an SSB signal. Typically, it's 2.4 kHz wide. On the 40 meter band with 300 kHz of bandwidth, there's room for about 125 SSB signals side by side. On the 10 meter band, there's space for over 700 SSB signals side by side. Across all the available bandwidth for a foundation license holder in Australia, there's room for over 11,000 different SSB signals side by side. While we're on the subject of crowding, there's talk about the massive influx of FT8. Some call it a scourge. FT8 channels are transmitted within a single SSB channel, and each takes up 50 Hz. That means that within an SSB channel of 2.4 kHz, there's room for 48 different FT8 channels. And if you take into account the odd and even time slots, that doubles to 96 different signals, all within the same single SSB channel. So while FT8 is popular and growing, let's not get too excited about how much space it's taking up. From the perspective of an Australian Foundation license holder, it's taking up exactly six separate SSB slots, of those 11,000 across the six available bands, room for 576 separate FT8 signals, taking up a total of 14.4 kHz, or 0.05% of the available bandwidth. Let's look at this another way. Of the 26.65 MHz available bandwidth, 20 MHz is from the 70 cm band alone. That means that all the other bands put together fit inside the 70 cm band three times over. Let that sink in for a moment. Adding the 80 m, 40 m, 15 m, 10 m and 2 m band together fit inside the 70 cm band three times. You can use the 70 cm band alone for 800,000 FT8 signals. Remember that there's two time slots, so you get two for one. If this makes your mind explode, then consider that a carrier wave signal is considered to be about 25 hertz wide. So on the 70 centimeter band, you could have 800,000 individual CW signals. You could allocate a personal CW frequency to every one of the amateurs in the United States in the 70 centimeter band and still have room for expansion. Not that I'm advocating that, just to give you a sense of scale. I should note that the 70 cm band in the United States is even larger than it is in Australia, but I don't want to get bogged down into the various band plans across the world at the moment. You might ask yourself, why am I getting so excited about this? Amateur radio is about experimentation. I've been telling you about HF propagation and using techniques like FT8 to determine just how far your signal goes. But you could use the same techniques to build a 70 cm communication network with the amateurs within your city and share information across the city, perhaps even build a mesh network using your 70 cm handheld and an FT8 call network. It could be used to distribute propagation information, or messages in case of an emergency, or form the basis of something completely different. If that doesn't whet your appetite, consider that the 1mm amateur band, which runs from 241 to 250 gigahertz, is ready for you to experiment when your license permits. The current world distance record is 114 kilometers, set in 2008, by Brian Whiskey Alpha 1 Zulu Mike Sierra and Peter Whiskey 4 Whiskey Whiskey Quebec. It has 9 gigahertz bandwidth and has room for 360 million FT8 signals or 60 exclusive FT8 channels for every amateur on the planet. My point is that as radio amateurs, we have access to a massive chunk of radio bandwidth, and it's just sitting there, waiting for you to experiment with. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. It's time for this week's propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspots have continued to appear every day after April 11th, which was the last day with no sunspots. Average daily sunspot numbers rose this week from 35.1 to 47.6, and the average daily solar flux also rose from 78 to 79.2. 
Geomagnetic indicators were quieter with average daily planetary A indices declining from 16.4 to 10.7. The most active day was April 25th with a planetary A index of 20. Looking ahead now, the predicted solar flux over the next month is 77, 75, 72 on April 30th, all the way through May 2nd, 70 on May 3rd through the 6th, 72 on May 7th through the 9th, 73 on May 10th through the 11th, and 74 on May 12th through the 13th. The predicted planetary A and dice will be 8 on April 30th through May 1st, 15, 12, 12 once again, and 8 on May 2nd through the 5th, 5 on May 6th through the 10th, 8, 12, 20, and 30 on May 11th through the 14th, and 15 on May 15th through the 16th. Time now for the AMSAT report from Bruce Page, KK5DO. It's been quite some time since FO29 was launched, August 17th, 1996 to be exact. It did get sick in its old age and the command station has been working to keep it alive. FO29 is now available for use on a schedule that will keep the batteries from completely giving out. The command team turns on the satellite based on their schedule, and when the battery voltage drops, that's it for that pass. Bruce has some dated photos of the Japan Amateur Radio League and its FO-29 command station. The station has probably been updated since. Visit amsat.com and click on History and Pictures. You might see a model of FO-29 and its older sister, FO-20. If you'd like to try out FO29 when it's turned on, the transponder is inverting. The uplink is 145.900 to 146.000, lower sideband. And the downlink is 435.800 to 435.900 USB. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. 85 students in secondary schools and colleges in Mauritius recently learned how basic affordable materials such as aluminum rods and PVC pipes can be transformed into an antenna that listens to satellites. Training workshops were organized at 12 schools and 5 universities by the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council. The lessons included installation of the antenna on a school rooftop and tools for satellite tracking and decoding of satellite telemetry and images on the amateur radio bands. Students also learned about radio waves and communication. Organizers are hoping the lessons will fortify the future of satellite and space technology in the Republic of Mauritius as students graduate into their eventual professional careers. The students used their homebrew antenna and a software-defined radio, and at the end of the training, the council assisted in the creation of a miniature ground station. The radios and antennas remain at the schools to enable workshops to train more classes in the years ahead. The Federal Communications Commission has announced that rule changes detailed in a lengthy 2019 report and order governing RF exposure standards go into effect on May 3, 2021. With more on these modified requirements for amateurs, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The new rules don't change existing RF exposure or RFE limits, but do require that stations be evaluated against existing limits unless exempt. For stations already in place, that evaluation must be completed by May 3rd, 2023. After May 3rd of this year, any new station or any existing station modified in a way that's likely to change its RFE profile, such as different antennas or placement or greater power, will need to conduct an evaluation by the date of activation or change. The FCC anticipates that few hams would have to reevaluate their stations under the new rules. The amateur service is no longer categorically excluded from certain aspects of the rules as amended, and licensees can no longer avoid performing an exposure assessment simply because they're transmitting below a given power level. The 2019 FCC RF report and order changes the methods that many radio services use to comply with FCC RFE limits. HAMS will have to determine whether any existing facilities excluded under the old rules now qualify for an exemption under the new rules. Most will, but some may not. <laughs> 
Removal of the categorical exclusion means that HAMS must perform some sort of calculation, either to determine if they qualify for an exemption or have to perform a full-fledged exposure assessment. ARRL has help at www.arrl.org forward slash RF hyphen exposure. In the RF report and order, the Commission anticipated that few parties would have to conduct re-evaluations under the new rules and that such evaluations will be relatively straightforward, the FCC said in an April 2nd public notice. It nevertheless adopted a two-year period for parties to verify and ensure compliance under the new rules. For most amateurs, the major difference is the removal of the categorical exclusion for amateur radio, which means that ham station owners must determine if they either qualify for an exemption or must perform a routine environmental evaluation, said Greg Lapin, N9GL, chair of the ARRL RF Safety Committee and a member of the FCC Technological Advisory Council. Ham stations previously excluded from performing environmental evaluations will have until May 3, 2023 to perform these. After May 3, 2021, any new stations or those modified in a way that affects RF exposure must comply before being put into service, Lapin said. The FCC also modified the process for determining whether a particular device or deployment is exempt from a more thorough analysis by replacing a service-specific list of transmitters, facilities, and operations for which evaluation is required with new streamlined formula-based criteria. The report and order also addressed how to perform evaluations where the exemption does not apply and how to mitigate exposure. Amateur radio licensees will have to determine whether any existing facilities previously excluded under the old rules now qualify for an exemption under the new rules. Most will, but some may not. For amateurs, the major difference is the removal of the categorical exclusion, Lapin said, which means that every ham will be required to perform some sort of calculation either to determine if they qualify for an exemption or must perform a full-fledged exposure assessment. For hams who previously performed exposure assessments on their stations, there is nothing more to do. The ARRL laboratory staff is available to help amateurs to make these determinations and, if needed, perform the necessary calculations to ensure their stations comply. ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, who helped prepare ARRL's RF Exposure and U book, explained it this way. The FCC did not change any of the underlying rules applicable to amateur station evaluations, he said. The sections of the book on how to perform routine station evaluations are still valid and usable, especially the many charts of common antennas at different heights. Hare said ARRL lab staff also would be available to help amateurs understand the rules and evaluate their stations. RF Exposure and You is available for free download from ARRL. ARRL also has an RF safety page on its website. The ARRL RF Safety Committee is working with the FCC to update the FCC aids for following human exposure rules. OET Bulletin 65 and OET Bulletin 65 Supplement B for radio amateurs. In addition, ARRL is developing tools that all hams can use to perform exposure assessments. In the east of the UK, Norfolk's radio hams managed to contact 923 other radio amateurs in 71 countries on last Saturday's International Marconi Day. As we previously reported, the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club ran the all-day event from Caister to commemorate the original Marconi wireless station there, which was established in 1900. The station was in a house in the high street known as Pretoria Villa, and its original purpose was to communicate with ships in the North Sea and the Cross Sands Lightship.
Operation is normally from case to lifeboat station, but due to COVID restrictions, the amateurs operated from their own home stations this year. Using the call sign Golf Bravo Zero Charlie Mike Sierra and a mixture of Morse code, speech and digital modes, the operation ran from midnight to midnight and contacts were made with other radio amateurs across the UK, Europe, Asia, South America and the USA. Notable contacts were made with New Zealand, the Philippines, Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, Panama, the Falkland Islands and Indonesia. On Saturday, the closest to Marconi's birthday, stations around the world were set up at sites with historical links to the inventor's work. Norfolk Amateur Radio Club Public Relations Officer Steve Nichols, Golf Zero Kilo Yankee Alpha, said that everyone pulled out the stops and they were able to operate throughout the night with Chris, G0 Delta Whiskey Victor, making 300 contacts. The rest of the event featured operations from eight other club members. Steve said QSO levels were high, but they did tail off as the day wore on, as you might expect. Steve even received an email from John Golf 7 Mike Alpha Romeo stroke Maritime Mobile, who was on the cruise ship Crystal Serenity, a few miles off the coast of Singapore. John heard the Marconi station, but unfortunately couldn't get through the pileup. Steve said that everyone made a great effort and it was nice to support International Marconi Day. Hopefully we'll be back next year, he said. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. At its April 5th meeting via Zoom, the ARRL Executive Committee nominated past ARRL President Joel Harrison, W5ZN, to become the next Secretary of the International Amateur Radio Union. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reports from League Headquarters. The incumbent Secretary, Dave Sumner, K1ZZ, has announced his intention to step down on July 1st. ARRL International Affairs Vice President Rod Stafford, W6ROD, explained that ARRL as IARU Secretariat has the right and obligation to appoint a successor. Harrison currently serves as IARU Assistant Secretary. The ARRL Board of Directors ratified his nomination on April 16th. The EC also agreed to hold an in-person Board of Directors meeting in July in accordance with Connecticut COVID-19 regulations. With changes pending in the 9 centimeter band, the EC adopted a new calling frequency for that band of 3400.1 MHz. Minutes of the EC meeting have been posted. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, told the executive committee that a new procedure was being put into place to recognize centenarian members, those who are 100 years of age or older. The membership team will now identify members who qualify for ARRL's Centurion Award, and the corresponding director will determine how to proceed with the award presentation. The executive committee agreed to include a $100 ARRL gift certificate to accompany the award. The U.S. segment of amateur radio on the International Space Station is seeking volunteers to support its mission. ARIS USA is best known for providing opportunities, mostly for students, to speak via ham radio with astronauts on board the space station. 
Less known is its important role in providing and supporting amateur radio equipment for the ISS, NA-1SS, which could offer backup communications in an emergency. Its primary objective is educational, to inspire, teach, and engage youth and communities in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics via amateur radio. We're seeking knowledgeable and enthusiastic volunteers who can work effectively as part of a team to support a variety of functions, said Eris USA Executive Director Frank Bauer, KA3HDO. We have volunteer openings in several senior leadership roles, including Associate Director, Treasurer, Secretary, Director of Business Development, Director of Volunteer Resources, Director of Public Engagement, and Director of Engineering. ARIS also has volunteer opportunities to support functions within those roles, as well as openings within the ARIS USA Operations, Engineering, and Education teams. As an amateur radio license is desirable, details on responsibilities for these positions are contained in the ARIS USA bylaws in Articles 5 and 8. Candidates accepted into senior leadership positions will be required to serve a six-month probationary period. All candidates for senior leadership positions must be U.S. citizens. Submit your resume or CV with a cover letter explaining what position you're interested in. Eris USA is an equal opportunity organization and will not discriminate on the basis of gender identity, age, race, color, national origin, religion, physical handicap, disability, or any other legally protected status. In the U.S., ARIS sponsors include ARRL, AMSAT, NASA, the ISS National Lab Space Station Explorers, and NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program. ARIS USA is a 501c-3 charitable educational and scientific nonprofit incorporated in the state of Maryland. Look out for a number of Spanish stations which will be active between May the 7th and the 9th to commemorate the creation of the European Union in an event called Europe Day on the Air 2021. The EU was created back in 1950 and the running of the event is a collaboration between a number of European radio amateur organisations. The special call signs are Alpha Oscar 1 Echo Uniform sequentially all the way up to Alpha Oscar 9 Echo Uniform. As usual, a special QSL card and an award will be available. And contacts in this event are also valid for the Radio Clubs of the World Award, also known as EANET. You can QSL all of the call signs via Echo Alpha 3 Romeo Kilo Foxtrot. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, which are a members-only benefit. Visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page to register, check on upcoming webinars, and view previously recorded sessions. HF Noise Mitigation, hosted by ARRL Northwestern Division, Director Mike Ritz, W7VO. This webinar will be held on Thursday, May 6th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 1930 UTC. An educational seminar to help both new and experienced HF operators who find themselves plagued with noise. We'll learn what noise is, discuss the various noise sources, and talk about how to mitigate those noises using a variety of techniques. W1AW Antenna Farm, hosted by W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia and J1Q, is scheduled for Tuesday, May 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Experience a bird's eye view and description of the antennas used by W1AW for the station's scheduled transmissions and visiting operator activity. All the antennas used at W1AW are single band Yagi's. Viewers will also see the 5 GHz sector antennas that are part of W1AW's Arden system. Ask the Lab how ARRL's Technical Information Service can help you. Hosted by ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare. W1RFI will be held on Tuesday, June 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Learn all about the ARRL Technical Information Service and the expert ARRL Laboratory staff who answer thousands of questions each year from members. Get tips about projects, suggestions to address various station installations, and help for some of your most pressing ham radio questions. You'll discover how to search ARRL's extensive periodicals archive, find helpful articles, read test reports, access technical forums, and find answers to technical questions beyond the lab. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. 
ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. The smartphone you're probably holding in your hand right now might be the key to better propagation for your future QSOs, according to a study by astronomer at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Scientist Sten F. Odenwald has published his findings which say that smartphones built in magnetometers can be a useful tool in detecting some of the strongest geomagnetic storms. Magnetometers, which are capable of detecting fluctuations in magnetic fields, assist both Android and iOS smartphone users in utilizing the phone's function as a compass. Odenwald writes that although there is some interference from other components in the phones causing digital noise, the detection capability remains largely intact. So when geomagnetic storms occur, for instance, after the sun ejects plasma, changes occur in the magnetic field and the smartphone is capable of picking that up. He told the Academic Times, smartphones, at least theoretically, should be able to detect some of the strongest storms pretty easily, in fact, especially if you happen to live up in the northern latitudes in Minnesota or in Canada or places like that where it really rocks and rolls. He said he's been studying the phone's ability to detect storms since 2017 with some success, adding that his results were still inconclusive. The International Space Station has a new commander as four astronauts prepare for their return to Earth this Saturday, May 1st. The orbital residents will also send off a Russian cargo craft on Tuesday evening, completing its year-long stay at the orbital lab. The four SpaceX Crew-1 astronauts have a new splashdown date after mission managers waved off Wednesday's planned departure due to weather conditions at the landing site. The quartet of Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and Siochi Noguchi is now targeting a splashdown off the coast of Florida for Saturday morning at 11.36 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. NASA TV began its continuous live coverage at 3.30 p.m. Friday, starting with hatch closure of the Crew Dragon Resilience. Resilience, with its four-person crew, then autonomously undocked from the Harmony's module, Spacefaring International Docking Adapter, completing a 164-day station research mission. Walker handed over station command to Akiko Hoshida from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency during the traditional change of command ceremony. Hoshida, Japan's second station commander, will now lead Expedition 65 until October of this year. Hoshida arrived at the Orbital Lab on April 24th aboard the Crew Dragon Endeavor with SpaceX Crew-2. NASA astronaut Shane Kimbra commanded Endeavor riding alongside pilot Megan MacArthur and mission specialist Hoshida and Thomas Pesquet during the near 24-hour trip that began with a launch from Kennedy Space Center. Staying on the orbiting lab with the four Crew-2 astronauts are NASA astronaut Mark Vandehey and Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky and Pyotr Dubrov. The trio docked to the station's Razvat module inside the Soyuz MS-18 cruise ship on April 9th and will stay on orbit until October. Russia's ISS Progress 75 cargo craft has been packed with trash and discarded gear and its hatch closed for undocking. It will leave the Zevda service modules aft port and spend another day orbiting Earth on its own before re-entering Earth's atmosphere above the Pacific Ocean for a fiery but safe destruction. For normal crew rescue and recovery operations, the NASA and SpaceX teams select two primary splashdown locations from the seven possible locations about two weeks prior to return, with additional decision milestones taking place prior to crew boarding the spacecraft, during free flight, and before Crew Dragon performs a deorbit burn. NASA and SpaceX closely coordinated with the U.S. Coast Guard to establish a 10 nautical mile safety zone around the expected splashdown location to ensure safety for the crew aboard the spacecraft, those involved in the recovery operations, and the public. An April 20th amateur radio on the International Space Station contact with youngsters in the small town of Winmalee, New South Wales, Australia, folded excitement and enthusiasm into their studies. It was a live demonstration for ham radio trainees in Belgium, too. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more on this exciting contact in this report filed from League Headquarters in Newington. It took a couple of years to arrange the ham radio hookup with teacher Allison Broderick's K-6 through pupils at Winmalee Public School, but the effort put into the enterprise paid off. 
astronaut Victor Glover, KI-5BKC, at NA-1SS, fielded questions on a range of space travel-related topics. The telebridge contact involved a direct two-meter ham radio connection between Glover on the ISS and ARIS team member Jean Popier, ON-7UX, in Belgium. Two-way long lines, audio between Belgium and Australia, completed the circuit for the approximately 11-minute contact. The ham radio contact gave eight youngsters a possibly life-changing opportunity to learn about living and traveling in space by speaking with somebody who's already there. Hi, my name is Erin, and my question is, what is the best way to describe the feeling of microgravity? Over. I would say it is like dreaming about flying. What personal items would you take into space if allowed, and why? Over. I brought pictures of my family. That was probably the most important thing. Glover's number one piece of advice, be resilient, don't stop in the face of challenges. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. When Malie's public school curriculum includes a weekly STEM lab taught by a specialist primary science educator, space-based studies also included lessons about the solar system, space missions, and the future of space exploration. Lessons in the run-up to the ARIS contact focused on the space station, how to track its position in orbit using applied mathematics, and the ISS crew members and their roles. Kindergartner Alberto Campos Wagner enjoyed getting to ask Glover how the crew avoids hitting space junk. First grader Indiana Bartouche admitted to being nervous, but despite her butterflies, it went well. I like the way Victor talked to me, she said. Fourth grader Iva Dacey appreciated the once-in-a-lifetime experience, while fifth grader Erin DeBono expressed amazement that there were no technology glitches. I'm still on a massive cloud of happiness, 6th grader Asher Renwick said. Victor was so nice, and his answers were excellent. I realize that most people come home to their family each day and take that for granted, but astronauts can't do that. The whole thing was better than I ever thought it could be. Glover's number two piece of advice was to be a lifelong learner, learning inside and outside of the classroom, and number three is to be a good teammate and you'll always achieve success, no matter what your dreams are. Channel 9 TV in Sydney aired a news story about the Winmalee contact that was posted to Facebook. Stefan Dombrowski, ON6TI, and Luke Vlieken, ON4ALV, took advantage of the opportunity to listen in to the direct two-meter signal from the ISS as a demonstration for their Belgian Army trainees learning about amateur radio. We both used the Australian Winmalee Public School ARIS QSO ISS Pass between Victor Glover, KI5BKC, and the students to demonstrate amateur radio, Dombrowski said. This was a success as we heard all 18 questions and answers and the brief sign-off at both our sites with just a simple handheld station. It was an excellent demonstration of ham radio capabilities and was also a good educational demonstration of antenna polarization and signal weakening with distance. The N1MM Logger Plus team has made it easy for operators to participate in four contests with just one log. The 7th QP, 7th Call Area, Indiana, Delaware, and New England QSO parties all take place this weekend, and sponsors have agreed to coordinate that so the four can be logged in a single log. The program software allows users to log stations active in all four QSO parties, and it automatically determines the state multiplier from the received exchange. Log the exact exchange received, and after the contest, submit the same Cabrillo file to all four contest sponsors. If you're in a state participant for one of the three QSO parties, select the appropriate state party option in the QSO party contest selector. If you're an out-of-state participant for all the four contests, select the IN7QPNE option in the drop-down state selector. If you're in the FTX mode, you may hear stations calling CQFD. They're participating in the Delaware QSO party. The current version of the WSJTX software can't accommodate most QSO party exchanges, so the Delaware QSO party sponsors are encoding the three Delaware countries in counties in the field day exchange for their event. 
DEQP participants should be in the field day contest mode and use 1A DE for Newcastle County, 2 Alpha DE for Kent County, and 3 Alpha DE for Sussex County. Stations outside of Delaware use 1 Alphas and their ARRL RAC section or DX. For example, 1A WA. Suggested frequencies for the Delaware QSO party FTX contacts are 4 kHz above the normal FTX frequency. FTX mode contacts must be submitted in a separate file from contacts made using other modes. As always, see the rules for the details. And submit your party QSO logs to StateQSOParty.com for the State Party QSO Challenge. The StateQSOParty.com website contains a tool to show your separate scores for the New England, Delaware, Indiana, and 7th Call Area QSO Party. Those scores are unofficial. Contest sponsors will calculate your official score from the logs that you submit. If things go as planned, all eyes will be on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand later this year where a rocket lab launch vehicle may become the means by which an amateur radio satellite made of wood will take to the skies. This is a project known as WISA Woodsat and is a more durable version of the KITSAT, the educational CubeSat it's based on. The launch of the one kilogram satellite into polar orbit, if it happens, will determine whether treated wood can serve as a good material for a spacecraft. The solar-powered satellite will reach an altitude of between 500 and 550 kilometers or 310 to 340 miles, will have an orbit that takes less than 90 minutes. Mission Manager Jari Makinen of Arctic Astronautics said in a statement on the Engineering and Technology website, in addition to testing plywood, the satellite will demonstrate accessible radio amateur satellite communication, host several secondary technology experiments, validate the Kitsat platform in orbit, and popularize space technology. The concept for a wooden satellite is not new. Earlier this year, Newsline reported on a partnership between a business and a university in Japan to create an environmentally friendly wooden satellite to launch by 2023. In a time and age where there's instant gratification, validation and criticism for everything we do, thanks to social media, imagine receiving a tangible form of communication through a letter or postcard from a stranger from thousands of kilometers away, and most importantly, something that is meaningful. Sending and receiving postcards is a meaningful hobby turned into a passion, says Jai Sakthivel Thangavel, who is a professor of journalism and communications at the University of Madras. A seasoned philatelist and avid post-crosser, Sakthivel is most proud of his QSL card collection, a trove with over 2,000 cards from radio amateurs from different parts of the globe. QSL cards are exchanged between ham radio operators to confirm contacts between two radio stations or to acknowledge shortwave listener reports. So, every time the listener sends a reception report to a radio station, they receive a QSL card back in return. From a very young age, Sakthivel had the habit of listening to the radio and tuning into these stations from across the world. He's known as a DXer for trying to find stations a long distance away from his location. His tryst with the QSL cards began in the early 90s, when, after sending a reception report, he received his first card from a radio station in the Netherlands. And although it's more than 20 years ago now, Sakthivel vividly remembers how he instantly got hooked on QSLing. He said, Receiving a card from another country motivated me to send more reception reports. It benefits the radio stations because they're able to ascertain their reach of the signal, while I started getting interesting cards, including a wooden QSL card. There are other kinds, like three-dimensional and printed paper QSL cards, and there are even leather ones, he said. Well, you can read the full article about this at the New Indian Express, www.newindianexpress.com. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. This is one of those reports I'd prefer not to make. This tragedy is supposed to remind us of how dangerous tower work can be, despite years of our own personal experience. In Cleveland, North Carolina last year, three men fell 1,000 feet to their deaths. The three people ages 40, 19, and 16 years old shall go unnamed here, but they were painting a 1,500-foot tall broadcast tower owned by WFMX-FM. There was a problem with the winch used to raise and lower the work platform they were using during this tower painting job. 
The cable became disconnected from the winch, which allowed the basket and the three men to fall to their deaths. No foul play was suspected. As hams, we can benefit from this horrible accident by learning about one of the dangers of tower work I have reinforced in the years this series has been on the air. Since, as hobbyists, we can pick and choose our tower jobs, the ones you should always refuse are the ones where your safety is obviously and totally in the hands of another person. I would also strongly recommend using two attachment systems to secure you to the tower when you arrive at your work site on the tower. When I'm working on a sidearm, I strap myself to the sidearm and to the tower. If the sidearm broke away, the heavy strap above me would catch and hold both me and the sidearm. My upper sidearm strap is very lightweight but strong enough to pull even my truck from a ditch during the winter. My harness goes around my waist and between my legs, and my shoulder harness is joined to my belt. I attach at the chest and waist to the tower. If either system fails, the other is more than sufficient to take over the entire job of securing me to the tower. Next time you climb, keep in mind this horrible accident and work with me to make this year tower accident free. Always use two attachment systems and plan your work around safety. No mistake about it, tower work at any height can become deadly if you don't use the proper safety gear. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, the synthesizer Elliot Curtis was cleaning was quite popular in the 1960s when LSD-friendly musicians were looking for new sounds. Unbeknownst to them, they left a few remnants behind. When the great wave of 1960s optimism finally broke and hippiedom gave way to Vietnam and Richard Nixon, the end of an era had never been clear. Nonetheless, counterculture remnants are still alive and well, as a radio operator found out after accidentally getting dosed with a 50-year-old dose of LSD. According to Daily Mail, KPIX Channel 5 broadcast operations manager Elliot Curtis was merely trying to fix an old synthesizer he found in a cold, dark closet in San Francisco's Cal State University East Bay, where he started feeling different. There had been rumors that 1960s radio operators would dip their fingers in liquid LSD and touch their devices for inspiration, but this had been just rumors at that point. That is until Curtis started to tinker with a Buchla Model 100 literally covered in the drug. After he removed a module to clean a crust or some type of crystalline residue that bothered him, the substance seemed to dissolve in his hand and began to alter his perspective. He says, it was like, felt like I was tripping on LSD, said Curtis, who began noticing a weird tingling sensation 45 minutes later. Little did Curtis know that the damp, lightless conditions had provided the perfect environment for the lysergic acid to retain its potency even half a century later. Then he tripped for nine straight hours. Coincidentally, Albert Hoffman, who first synthesized the substance in 1943, accidentally dosed himself with the drug in this manner as well. LSD is usually consumed orally through blotting paper dipped in the drug or taken in liquid form directly, so the notion that cleaning an old machine could get one high was the furthest from Curtis's mind. Whether the psychoactive substance was secretly stashed under the machine's module, on purpose, or merely forgotten there, is unclear. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world, on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system, on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates, Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates, Incorporated. All rights reserved.